Senator Blue, what purpose do you rise? To debate the bill. The Senator has the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate. I'd like to take a different approach to this bill. First, I think all of you know and to some degree subscribe to the golden rule, regardless of your religion. The seven major religions in the world all have some version of it. And I mentioned that to you because you learned it when you were young. And it was sort of emphasized to me when I got to law school, one of my property, real property law professor said, you know, the way that you can tell whether somebody is really fair uh, in the way they go about doing things, if you want to divide land or if you want to do anything else. He said, you let them divide the land, and then you let the people who are going to receive it, including the one who divides it, choose first. That'll keep them honest and it'll keep them fair because you don't know which side you're going to end up on at any given time. And so I warn you about this kind of bill. Be careful of how you stack things because you don't know whether it's going to be stacked against you. And if you were really interested in, I think, observing the fundamental, I think, the most fundamental of the fundamental rights in this country, and that is the right to vote, you would first set out by devising or uh, creating a system that is absolutely fair. Wouldn't matter which side of the political spectrum you're on, it would be a system that if you were the last one to choose, you'd still get a fair shot out of it. Now, this bill, and I don't think that any of you can really argue it seriously, makes it harder for legal registered North Carolinians, legally registered North Carolinians to vote. Now, I don't know what you're going to do when you come back and start changing the requirements for registration. But you know, we have a registration system that has evolved over time. And I say evolved because when I was in college, the only way you could register was to go to the courthouse or a specific person at a designated time. They had fixed registrars. Then we came up with a system of floating registrars who could register people within their precinct. And they would get the IDs and they would register them. And then we came up with a system of floating registrars that could register people anywhere in the county. And we realized that if we truly believed in this democracy and full participation, we needed to make it easier for folk to get registered. And so we eventually evolved to so that you could register with any ID and send in your registration. I don't know what you're going to do about having people legally registered. Are you going to require the same strenuous system of ID before they register? Because if you're not, you're creating a system of legally registered voters having greater difficulty to vote than is justified. Now, I say that it's the most fundamental of all of our basic constitutional rights. You know, the, the interesting thing is North Carolina joined the Union after 11 other states but after the Bill of Rights was ratified. And I believe that we still place importance on the Bill of Rights. And I believe in every single one of them, whether it's the Second Amendment, or whether it's the First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, or the Fifth Amendment, Senator Goosby. But you know, the interesting thing about it is that we make certain presumptions about these other fundamental rights in our Constitution. We presume that you're innocent until you're proven guilty. Most famous quote, the most famous quote by one of the most famous jurists in our country's history, Oliver Wendell Holmes, is it's better for 99 men to go free than for one innocent man to be convicted. You know, we have a system that believes in these basic core fundamental rights. We believe in the First Amendment, that you should publish anything you want to unless you come back and show by hard empirical evidence that somebody's going to cause harm. You, can, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. But otherwise, you can pretty much exercise your First Amendment rights, establishment, religion, speech, and all of the others. The presumption is that you are properly exercising that right. Here, in the most fundamental of all of the rights, you are adopting a presumption that everybody who wants to exercise it is somewhere rather crooked, or somebody who's looking to break the law. 
I ask you, what parent is going to spend twelve, fifteen thousand dollars or more than that now, probably sending somebody to one of the state universities to get a false ID card? In fact, that ID card is probably more reliable than any of the other ID cards that you'd come up with, because people are paying so much to get it. You know, some schools you're spending fifty thousand dollars a year to get that ID card. If somebody's going to forge that card, what are they going to forge it for? To go in the cafeteria and get a free meal? Or are they going to forge it to go vote? They may as well forge a legitimate card that you got here. It's crazy to think that these forms of IDs are not legitimate. But, but let's get back to the fundamental issue. This bill, I believe, goes further toward undermining these fundamental rights. And it's counter to what we are and who we are as North Carolinians. But you know, the amazing thing is we do adapt as North Carolinians. Uh, we adapted when you had to go all the way down to the courthouse, regardless of where you lived, to register. Uh, we adapted with all of the other impediments that have been imposed on voters, not just black voters. Uh, we put impediments in the way of average working people that we ought not have to do. And you know, it's convenient for people to vote at different times. And it's convenient to assume that when you take your kids, kids voting is one of the most popular things that happens here in Wake County, where you take 10, 11, eight, nine year old kids, show them what the process is. Many of us on a national level have been involved in the democracy project and other things, where we get legislators to go into classrooms, to talk to people, to encourage them to participate. Some of you have done it over the years. And if we encourage them, it makes sense that we encourage them to participate and believe in this democracy of ours and that what they do makes it stronger. I believe this bill undermines the democratic process and it flies in the face of the most basic, most basic of our fundamental values, and that is government by the people. And that means the more people who participate in government, the better that government is. That's why we want people to participate, not to cheat, not to do anything else. And the presumption ought to be that those who participate are rightfully participating. And the burden ought to be on the government to show that they've done it wrongly. And if they've done it wrongly, let's do the same way that we do when somebody has used a firearm that they're exercising their Second Amendment rights to by owning. Let's punish the person very severely who uses it the wrong way but don't take away the right. I hope you see how inconsistent this is with the way that we're dealing with our other fundamental rights. Now, one of the things that I'm concerned about, and that's why I was trying to amend some of these corporate positions out of this bill, because what we do is as much governed by perception as reality. Perception plays a big role in political leadership and in politics. And people perceive that special interest, big corporations, wealthy people, have a special sway with elected officials. That's why many of these laws that we have have evolved the way that they have. And when we put provisions in that makes it seem like government is going to the highest corporate bidder, that's what eliminates belief and faith and confidence in our government. That's what we ought to be concerned about, not just how it is, but how it is perceived. And I will tell you, when you start allowing additional contributions, corporate contributions in any form, then you are letting people perceive that their government is open to the highest and wealthiest bidders. I want you to look around the globe. Just look around this earth of ours. Every day almost, you see where somebody is moving toward freedom, because that's the natural order of things. People overturned the government again in Egypt because they didn't like the suppression that was happening. Every day, people are marching toward freedom. And who's the greatest example on the face of the earth for what freedom is? And who has been for almost 200 years or longer, and more so in the last 50 years? The United States of America. We are the model across the country for participatory democracy. That's why it was so important to increase the number of people participating in elections. 
so that it wouldn't just be something that seemed, but something that is. And here we are, here we are now flying in the face of that in North Carolina, making it more difficult to participate in this democracy of ours, not giving the presumption of legitimacy to what we do with our most fundamental rights. I say to you that, you know, and I've said before, that arrogance and ubris is what destroys great nations. It'll destroy a great state if we think we got all the answers and we think we know it all and are not willing to listen at other opinions and other viewpoints because we know it all. It is the recipe for the beginning of the decline of this state and our democracy. I have you know that I've given you the benefit of the promises that you made because you're my colleagues. And if you say that the major thing that we're going to do is create jobs and expand opportunities, then I take your word that that's what we intended to do. But I will tell you, when you look at perception and you look at how people are talking about what happens down here, you have to take a moment to pause to think that you don't believe that you've kept your promise. And somewhere or other you believe that, 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 that you have to do something out of the ordinary to make people believe what you say. Let me remind you, because nobody has mentioned it. You have absolute control of the election machinery. The Republican Party controls the election machinery in North Carolina. It's designed that way. If you think that something is going wrong at precincts and polling places, you control all of the judges, all of the judges at polling places who can put an end to it. You control the registrars. You control every state board of elections. I mean, every county board of elections. You control the state board of elections. They're the ones who have expertise in this stuff and can tell you what ought to happen to make sure that it still has the integrity. What I want to believe, my friends, is that articles that I read and things that I hear aren't necessarily so because as you get painted, so do all of us get painted. I will close my comments by sharing with you an editorial that many of you may have seen this morning because it has a bearing on how people perceive you are behaving when you try to act, enact a bill like this. And it talks about pay cuts for teachers or cuts of teachers in the classroom. It talks about the tax breaks to the wealthy and special corporations getting special treatment. But then it says, with these approaches to taxing and spending, North Carolinians will be motivated to vote in 2014, but Republicans have a plan for that too. Those are not my words. On Wednesday, the General Assembly was on the verge of approving, and on today, approving the strictest voter ID requirements in the nation. And it didn't even go on to talk about not just the voter ID requirements, but these ways that you're rolling back the evolution of voting rights in North Carolina and voting opportunity and opportunities to participate does not talk about the way that you're rolling back and putting barriers to the election's participatory process. But it says, the requirements are supposed to protect the voting process, but their real intent is to protect Republican office holders. If there were any doubt, Senate amendments to the House Voter ID Bill make it clear. And it delineates the ways that you have not only dealt with voter ID, but all of these other things that we've been talking about. That's what we've been trying to tell you about. You know, you come to us, we could reach an agreement on an acceptable voter ID bill. All of us want integrity in who votes. We could reach agreement on something like that. But these other things are things that have evolved to make this democracy be a richer, more meaningful, and fuller democracy that gives great justification for our Bill of Rights, our Constitution, and even our Declaration of Independence. So I say to you that I don't want to believe necessarily what newspaper editors around the state are writing. 
I don't know whether the Wall Street Journal will write one or not, Mr. President. But I do want to believe that as we go about this process, that we have integrity, that we're not taking steps to enshrine ourselves, to ensure that we stay in office, but that we're taking steps to ensure that this democracy, which we all profess to love so much, gets strengthened over time, and it gets strengthened by ensuring that everybody, 100% of eligible Americans or North Carolinians, can participate. So I, I hope, I hope that some of the amendments that come will improve this bill, but I hope that when you take it to conference with the House, after you pass it here, that you will consider some of these things to strengthen this bill so that you'll strengthen our democracy. Senator Blue, for the record, where was the editorial from, please, so we can put it in the record. Dated Thursday, July 25th, and it says, Our Views, Scary Ending. It's the lead editorial in the Raleigh News and Observer this morning. Thank you, Senator. Further discussion and debate, Senator Robinson, for what purpose do you rise? To speak to the bill. Senator has the floor.